David, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We are learning, of course, uh, we just heard Emily talking about this, U.S. intelligence apparently aware of that Wagner plan to revolt. Antony Blinken saying just today that the writing's apparently been on the wall for a few months now. Did you get the impression that the administration knew this was coming? I find that fascinating. I didn't realize that there was intelligence that suggested that Wagner Group was preparing for this uh, as much as a week ago. What we did know, and Secretary Blinken referred to it, is that Prigozhin has been criticizing the Russian government and Russian military for months now. But he never criticized Putin. He only criticized the top brass in the military. For the first time two days ago, he criticized Putin. And as Blinken mentioned, he criticized the basis for the war and suggested that Ukraine and NATO were never a threat to Russia. He came right out and said that, which puts him in the crosshairs of Putin, and then he moved on Moscow. We still don't know why he turned around. He got a deal that was uh, moderated by Lukashenko, but you would worry for his safety. He's going to go to Belarus, and Belarus is basically a satellite state of Russia. Lukashenko is beholden to Putin. So if Putin wants to strike back at Prigozhin, it would probably be easy for him to do so. So this is kind of a tenuous alliance. And we don't also know what's going to happen with all of those Wagner troops who turned on Putin, turned on the Russian military. I also think it's very interesting that they didn't face much, much hostility from the Russian army as they marched toward Moscow. But then, of course, they suddenly turned around. In the long run, do you think that Putin's presidency survives this? It's hard to tell, and I don't think anyone can predict that. But he is certainly more vulnerable than anyone thought, and he's probably at his most vulnerable point since he became president. Uh, notably, he apparently sh fled Moscow when this was happening, which I think is an interesting contrast to what President Zelensky did when Ukraine was first invaded. Everyone thought uh, Russian troops might get to Kiev. Zelensky stayed put bravely. Putin, on the other hand, fled when just a small army of Wagner Group fighters were threatening Moscow. How do you see the conflict in Ukraine playing out in, in the wake of this rebellion? Is Russia significantly weaker in this fight without the help of the Wagner Group? I think we'll see the evidence of that over the next few weeks and months. It's certainly, the Ukrainian military is going to try to take advantage of this dissension in Moscow and make gains of territory in Ukraine. And they've already stepped up their offensive to try and take advantage of that. Let's see how much territory they gain back. And let's see what happens with these Wagner troops. Reportedly, they are heading back to the theater in Ukraine, but who knows if they're actually going to be motivated to fight. And not only motivated, how can they stand alongside, alongside Russian soldiers after the events of the last 36 hours? That's right, because there were some skir skirmishes with the Russian army. Uh, apparently, the Wagner group took down an airplane. There were skirmishes with some Russian helicopters. But they didn't meet a lot of uh, pushback from the Russian army. Many Russian soldiers apparently just stood by. They didn't join the Wagner group, but they just watched. So maybe they can make amends, but it, it's, it's curious, and you really don't know. What do you make, and what do you think Putin is making of, of not the actions of the Wagner group and Prigozhin, but the reactions of his own people and the reaction of the Russian soldiers as they were watching this march take place. You know, it's always hard to tell exactly how much the Russian people know about this. Uh, apparently, in, in a very, you know, Russia holds a tight information, a tight, tight grip on information. And apparently, uh, Putin even shut down Google when this was happening and shut down other social, so, shut down social media sites. So it may have been hard for them to know. But Telegram was reporting on this, and Prigozhin was using Telegram to speak to the Russian people. So they know some stuff about it, but we don't know exactly how. Putin is playing it, and certainly he's trying to play it in a favorable way for himself. Any uh, alarm or concern that we do not know the whereabouts of Prigozhin at this hour, or is that expected as far as you know? I guess that's expected. I mean, apparently he was seen leaving uh, southern Russia on his way to Belarus. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I think he's very vulnerable. Uh, 
Putin uh, is known to assassinate anyone who challenges him. Any potential leader who is a threat to him ends up being dead. And I would think that he's a target. He may have a deal. But can he trust Putin that Putin will honor that deal? So what is Prigozhin's next move? It's a it's a bit of a chess match, and we don't know what he's going to do next and from where he will do it. Certainly. And, and Belarus, is that a safe haven for him? Wouldn't he much rather go to perhaps a Western country? And wouldn't it be a very dangerous game for a Western country to accept him at this point? Yeah, I don't think he would be welcome in a Western country. Remember, Prigozhin was the hero over the last 48 hours for turning against Putin, but Prigozhin is no real hero. He's responsible for lots of human rights abuses. Some of the worst atrocities in Ukraine were done by Wagner Group, by his fighters, and they also committed human rights abuses and atrocities in Africa and in and, and other countries around the world. So he, he's not probably welcome anywhere in the West, and there's not a lot of places as he can go, that he'll be safe if he can't go to a Western country. Okay, I appreciate the context and time. David Tafuri, thank you so much.